Do gravitational waves deflect like waves on the water? Which type of comet would cause the most destruction for Earth? Will we see humans on Mars in our lifetime? And in Q&A Plus, could AI become religious? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Web Fiji, which will have a greater devastation on Earth if it strikes? A solar system comet, an interstellar comet, or an intergalactic comet? Comets hitting the Earth are bad, um, but what causes the damage of a comet hitting the Earth? And comets are actually a little scarier than asteroids hitting Earth for a couple of reasons. One is they come out of nowhere. So with an asteroid, as we see with 2024 YR4, we get years of notice that this asteroid is on this potential collision course and we can figure out a way to try and change its trajectory years in advance so that it doesn't hit us. With a comet, they are coming out of nowhere. Often they're coming for the first time down into the inner solar system from the Oort cloud. And so you have at best months of warning, a year of warning before the comet is going to hit your planet. But also, comets can fragment. And this happens a lot. We see a lot of comets as they get too close to the sun, they can fragment and break apart. And so you can have a situation where a comet could go around the sun, come back towards us and then fragment. And then the fragment would create a larger area that could then impact the Earth. And if you had a comet that was tens of kilometers across, but it fragmented into chunks that were a couple of kilometers across, and they would just pepper the Earth more like a shotgun. So that's scary. But the that's sort of like half of the problem with comets, and the other half is the speed. So comets are coming down, falling into the inner solar system, and they can be falling very quickly. They can be coming faster than an asteroid can hit the Earth. But the the farther away the comet came from, then the faster it's probably going. Because like, for example, Oumuamua, when it was coming through the solar system, it's on a hyperbolic orbit, it is traveling so quickly through the solar system that it's not being trapped by the gravitational well, it's falling in, and then it's going back out to then continue exploring the Milky Way. And so it's going faster than the kind of comet if it just started out in the Oort cloud and fell in. Now an intergalactic comet, let's say we have comets here, the Earth, and they have to escape the Milky Way, then they have to be going 550 kilometers per second to be able to escape the gravity of the Milky Way. And so if you've got some comet that's in some other galaxy, and something kicks that comet out into an intergalactic velocity, it could be going a 1000 kilometers a second, right? Like way faster than anything we could see coming through the solar system. And if one of those hit the Earth, well, then you've got a lot more damage. So of the three choices that you gave me, the intergalactic comet it would be the most worrisome. But of course, you have to consider the mass of you know, it's all about the mass. So uh, a small mass moving quickly is the same damage as a large mass moving slowly. And so really, what is the mass but the yeah, I would be more worried about an intergalactic comet. And when you think about it, you know, we've seen intergalactic stars that are passing out well, I guess, you know, hyper velocity stars, stars that are on their way out of the Milky Way, because they had this close interaction with the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, that there are almost certainly hyper velocity stars that are coming from other galaxies moving into our galaxy, and probably they're bringing with them comets. And so this is entirely possible, but the number of them actually happening is, is going to be very low. James Sobeck, do gravitational waves reflect from masses that they wash over the way that water waves reflect from islands or shorelines? So gravitational waves, these are caused by mass that is moving through the universe that as you are walking around when you're driving your car, you are releasing gravitational waves into the universe, some amount of your just kinetic energy is turning into these gravitational waves that are then emanating out. Now, we can only really see the most massive versions of these when black holes are spiraling in in the last few seconds, they let out these gravitational waves that are detectable by the kinds of experiments that we have have here on Earth. But what happens to gravitational waves as they move past uh, various masses like 
planets, stars, even black holes. And, you know, when we think about regular waves, when waves pass islands, they can reflect, they can bounce off, they can be distorted. And so does the same thing happen to gravitational waves? And the answer is yes. When you have a gravitational wave that moves through space time, it is affected by space time in the same way that a photon, when a photon moves through space time and it gets too close to a gravitational well, then the photon will be deflected. It thinks it's following a straight path, but the reality is that because you've got this mass that is distorting space time, then the photon will follow this, this, what it thinks is straight space time, but in fact is a curved path from our perspective. And so gravitational waves, as they move through distortions in space time, they will also follow the paths that are most appropriate for them. And so you can imagine you've got gravitational waves that are moving towards, say, a black hole, which is sort of like the ultimate version of this question. And as the gravitational waves get very close to the black hole, the black hole is is torquing around space time, then the gravitational waves are going to get deflected and distorted and go around this black hole and have their directions changed and so on. But the black holes that cross the event horizon go in and they actually add to the mass of the black hole. And so, you know, it's, it's not very much, you know, and when you think about the amount of kinetic energy that is contained within a gravitational wave, very little is going to like turn into appreciable mass in the black hole, but it's not zero. And so when a gravitational wave gets close to a black hole, it gets distorted and can be can be have its you know directions changed, concentrated, all kinds of things. And any that falls right in to the event horizon becomes part of the black hole. It's time to shout out all the new five dollar patrons and above: Patrick Arnson, Deep Astronomy, Donald Mossman, Alex Wagoner, Rebecca Daly, Nigel May, Steve Kessler, Matthew Ryan, Namdi, and Phil Swan. Join the club at patreoncom universe today. Pat Logan, are there rogue gravitational waves? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, there would be rogue gravitational waves. Two gravitational waves that overlap with each other can combine their strength and align their troughs and align their peaks in the same way that that water waves can. Rob Wright, could an Earth mass planet exist stably at the very center of two stars of similar mass orbiting each other in a way the two stars would be orbiting the planet? So theoretically, yes, you can imagine that when you have two stars that are exactly the same mass down to the atom, and they are orbiting each other in perfect circular orbit, then they're orbiting around a barycenter, they're orbiting around a center spot. And if there's no other stars in the universe, no other galaxies, nothing around them, then they will continue on this perfect mathematical precision for ever, right to the end of time. And then at that very berry center, you put a planet in the middle of it. And that planet was positioned to within a quadrillionth of a meter, I don't know the amount, an infinitely small amount, and it was perfectly circular, had no uh, mountains, no distortions, nothing. It was just this perfect sphere down to the, you know, trillionth of a nanometer sitting in the middle of the barrier center, then you would have a stable system where the two stars are orbiting around and this planet is or is sitting in the middle, and everything is perfect forever. But uh, reality is that the stars aren't going to be the exact same mass down to the atom that the planet is going to have a, a wobbly uh, gravitational field with different you know mountains and densities of material inside of it. And that the stars are going to be on not a perfect circular orbit, they're going to be on slightly elliptical orbits. And then the planet is going to start to sort of move around inside this area and eventually instabilities are going to grow and then the planet is going to join one of the stars. So that's the, what the reality is going to happen. And it won't take very long. Uh, you know, in if a few decades, hundreds of years, the planet will be destroyed. Clockwork Rex. When do you think we'll see Betelgeuse explode? We have no idea when Betelgeuse is going to explode. The problem with stars like this is they don't tell us 
how much of their mass they have consumed at the core. When Betelgeuse is going to explode really is due to when it runs out of fuel in the core. Right now it is fusing together various elements, it's moving farther and farther up the chain of elements, and eventually it'll reach iron. And when it reaches iron, you can't get any energy out of fusing iron beyond what you put into it. And so there'll be no longer this light pressure that's coming out of this of the core. And then that causes all of the light pressure that's holding the star against the pull of gravity to implode. And then the thing will detonate as a supernova. And you know, how long will it take for Betelgeuse to explode? It could be tomorrow. And it could be a million years from now. And Betelgeuse is 640 light years away from us. And so that means that it could have exploded 640 years ago. And then we will just see the light tomorrow and know that it already happened. There's like a one in like 7,000 chance that it has already exploded. But most likely, it will not happen within our lifetimes. It'll happen within the next few hundred thousand years. But what if we did see Betelgeuse explode? It'd be incredible. It would start to brighten up over the course of about 10 days to reach its maximum brightness, and it would become as bright as the moon. You know, not necessarily as bright as the full moon, probably brighter than a quarter moon, somewhere in between that. But it would be very bright, like you could you could navigate outside, but it would be coming from a point object, not this circle, not from the moon, uh, which would be very strange. You could see it during the day. Um, and then it would slowly dim down to about say, three months later, it would no longer be visible during the day, only visible at night, and then it would slowly fade away. And then you just wouldn't be able to see it again, because now it would be dead. TJ, do you think we'll see humans on Mars in your lifetime? I mean, I'm gonna live through a multiple robot bodies until the end of time. So yes. But let's say that I don't move into a robot body, then will I see a human on Mars in my lifetime? Yeah, I'm 53 now. And it's 2025. So let's assume that we see humans on Mars by 2045, 20 years from now. So I'll be in my early 70s, which you know, my dad is 80. So I like my chances. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, will AI become religious? I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had. Thank you everyone who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who joined us for the live show. We are still on our live stream hiatus, returning in about a month. So stay tuned for that. I'm gonna ask for more of your media recommendations. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Barely Grooving, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Modzel, Paul Robach, Ryan Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Monley, Vlad Shiblin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level on all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So last week, I asked you for your recommendations for media, games, TV shows, books to read. And the response was amazing. Um, there was some like, like normally when I ask that kind of question, I didn't tend to see the same things over and over and over again. And it was all stuff that I had never heard of before. Like you guys dug deep and were able to find a lot of really great stuff. So I want to just put out the call again for maybe the people who missed it the first time around and maybe the people who already did it last week. But please go into the YouTube comments and let us know what you're watching, what you're playing, uh, what you're reading and dig deep some, you know, obscure stuff, stuff that maybe isn't going to be in the mainstream, but other people would be really interested to find stuff that, that you really enjoy, really look forward to podcasts, YouTube channels. Uh, let us know what you're watching. And uh, hopefully then people can look through that and and get some recommendations. I'm still reading the Dungeon Crawler Carl series. I think last time I mentioned I was on book one. Now I'm on book five. Um, and they're fantastic and they get better. So the, the first one is kind of the weakest and then they get stronger and you learn more about the world that this is in and the universe and 
the main character starts to have an impact that extends out beyond the dungeon that he's in and the characters are getting a lot better. So I'm really enjoying the show. And, you know, apparently it's been optioned for a TV show and that makes a ton of sense. So now I'm like really excited if that ever happens. But uh, yeah, so let me know what you're watching, what you're playing, what you're reading, and I will check it out, what you're listening to. All right, we'll see you next time.